Hi, my name is Tali Perch, and this is called Pieces of Home. When we emigrated from Soviet Ukraine in 1979, we were allowed to take neither money nor valuables. The government authorized a single shipping crate, which Baba, Mama's mother, packed with furniture from her own house. Before becoming a mother myself, I couldn't understand. Why fancy and practical furniture? Forty years later, compelled to leave love notes and baked goods behind for my own children, pieces of myself for a mere day's absence, I can now see Baba's crate for what it really was. Baba could not send herself, so she sent Mama pieces of herself instead, pieces of home. It must have been a shock when Mama and Papa, who brought us three to America for a better life, found that the best home they could afford in the land of opportunity was a dump. Even with four jobs between them, Mama and Papa could only buy a single bed for our bedroom. The bathroom had rings around the drains and ineradicable mildew on the caulking. At four, I had already learned to swallow my fear, flip on the lights, and count to ten before entering to take a pee giving the cockroaches time to scurry out of sight. The kitchen, also overrun by cockroaches, had only the necessary appliances, a small card table and folding chairs in the corner and grease-stained walls. Worst of all were the isolation and piercing silence that left my ears ringing. Even a dump might become a home amidst the familiar bustle of family. Could we three foreigners Two twenty-something parents and their small daughter really be a family? Could this crappy apartment in the shadow of Manhattan, where no one around us spoke our language, really become a home? Only our living room was beautiful, <clears throat> thanks to Baba's crate. A polished gold-trimmed mahogany credenza spanned the length of one wall, and tucked into the opposite corner stood a matching oval dining table, with six cushioned chairs. Tall crystal vases, which Mama occasionally filled with tulips or carnations, adorned both. The plush floral rug that covered the splintering floor would have been a comfort to Mama's cracked, bleeding heels had she ever chosen to walk on it, but she rarely had. I don't know why Mama avoided the opulence of that room. Maybe she didn't want to sully its perfection. Or maybe it made her homesick. Maybe the two are one and the same. But for whatever reason, Mama did not spend much time there. And because Mama was the life-giving sun around which Papa and I orbited, neither did we. We slept in the bedroom, peed, shit, and showered in the bathroom, but lived in the kitchen where most other things necessary for survival were located within arm's reach. Every night after work, Mama picked me up from school, then cooked dinner, served it, and cleaned within the claustrophobic container of our kitchen. Then she smoked camels alone on our balcony, a rusted fire escape outside the kitchen window after Papa left for one of his night jobs. The kitchen was where Papa disciplined me swiftly and intensely. Mama, on the other hand, wasn't much of a disciplinarian. When my truculence or failing grades upset her, she either screamed at me or smoked on the balcony, but she never struck me, not on purpose. There was just that one time in the kitchen by accident. Mama leaned over the balcony railing, still holding a wet dish towel in one hand, blowing smoke into the chill of winter. All week I had been nagging her to quit, but the moment the smell of burnt tobacco wafted my way, I decided to try a different tactic. Approaching the open window, I called Mama. When I had her attention, I flipped her off. It wasn't something I, it was something I had seen the cool kids do at school when they were angry. I was angry and now so was Mama. She snapped the dish towel towards me, but misjudged the distance, smacking the offending finger so hard 
It swelled fat as a hot dog. Remembering Mama's guilty cries of regret in our kitchen that day, I think we both suffered. <clears throat> but on those rare evenings when Mama surrendered to the living room, it somehow transformed her. One night, not long after the finger incident, I found Mama at Baba's table staring solemnly at the wall, looking sadder and more beautiful than I had ever seen her. I decided in that moment to give her a gift. Inching toward the table, I held a brooch, one I had stolen, out to Mama like a sacrifice, then placed it into her palm. For you, Mama. Under Mama's firm, knowing and gentle gaze, I felt safe in my crime. I didn't need to explain. Somehow, she already knew that I had stolen the brooch. Tears started welling up in her eyes, but she wiped them away, making space for mine. Later, there would be lectures, atonement, but in our living room that night, there was just Mama and me and home. Thank you, Mama said finally. It's beautiful.